Welcome to Limitless, the blind beginnings podcast where seeing things differently inspires limitless possibilities. This podcast is being brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Limitless was created in order to inform, educate, entertain, and share stories from within the blind and partially sighted community, in order to show the world that the opportunities for those who are blind or partially sighted are truly limitless. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host, the executive director and founder of Blind Beginnings, Sean Marcelet. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. In Canada, we have a federal election coming up on September 20th. And so today we're talking about accessible voting. What is the experience of people who are blind or partially sighted when it's time to go to the polling stations? Uh, but before we get into that, I want to introduce the co-hosts today, Colby and Nika. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi. Hi. Do you want to maybe remind our listeners uh, a little bit about your vision? Sure. So I have Peter's anomaly, and basically it mostly affects my front part of my eye. So I have my usable vision in my left eye, and I can see shapes, colors, but I can't see small details unless I'm up close. And I, my vision, um, I'm totally blind, but uh, I used to be able to see fairly good. Um, so I know what most things look like, but I don't see anymore, except for super bright sunlight. Okay, and we'll get into uh, hearing about your voting experiences in a minute, but I want to welcome back to the podcast our guest today, Betty Noble. Welcome back, Betty. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. So uh, Betty is the past president of Blind Beginnings, and also, do you want to maybe share a bit about your voting experience or history and your connection to elections? Sure, we can start there. Um, when I voted, uh, when I first voted in the dark ages, like 50 years ago or something like that, it all pretty much, if someone came with you, like there, you didn't have any kind of way to mark your own ballot. So you had to have somebody with you. And certainly that still happens today. But the thing that I really hated about it was that I had to sign a declaration saying that I was illiterate and unable to vote for myself. And I was a university student. And so to sign something that said I was illiterate really, really made me angry. Wow. <laughs> and so um, I'm so happy that elections are more accessible now. And um, Rob Sleeth, um, who is an, uh, an advocate in the blind community. I don't know if you've had him on the podcast or not, but no, you might want to yet. consider that at some point. But anyway, he um, did a lot of advocacy with respect to the BC election. And as a result of his work, um, I was asked if I would do Braille candidates lists for the BC elections. So um, I've done that for the last... I think the last three elections now, 2013 was the first one that I did. And um, it's, it's a lot of work. It's crazy in this house when it's happening because you have to do enough for all of the polling stations and all of the ridings in BC. And that's almost 5,000 copies. And so uh, wow. I have to have two embossers. <laughs> and, uh, but it's really important to me that um, Anybody who wants to read a list of candidates in Braille, it's really important that they have that ability to do that so that if someone puts the ballot in correctly and they use the Braille template, then they can people can mark their own ballots. And I think that's really, really cool. And um, I do them in uncontracted Braille so that even people with very limited Braille knowledge should be able to read them all right. And the way it's done, and you, you will actually see this on election day because somebody else does it for the federal election, there will be a number and then the name of the candidate and then the party that the candidate is with. And so the 
numbers on the Braille list correspond to the numbers on the template. So you can find the right number and then put your X in the little square and you are 99% sure. And I have to say that because you can't actually check your val ballot visually. And um, if you want it to remain secret, then no one else can check it either. But you're 99% sure that you've voted correctly. Now, it's really interesting because um, sometimes, even though people have been trained and they know about these lists being available, people will go to the polling station and be told that there is not a Braille candidate's yes. list. Yes, but that has in happened to me. fact, <laughs> there is. And you just have to really insist until they go find it. And the, the funny thing is, the first time that I did that, um, in 2013, they told me there wasn't any such thing. And I said, oh, yes, there is. I know there is because I did it. And I waited half an hour and I made them find it. <laughs> oh, good for you. Because I, I mm. just, I doubted myself. And I, I thought, well, I know that there has been in the past. So why wouldn't there be now? But uh, it's so frustrating when you know it's available and you can't access it. Absolutely right. Now, fortunately, because it's been done the last three elections, uh, the workers, especially some of them who uh, do this more than once, are more aware. Um, the only thing that happened in this most recent election was that the courier let me down. And sometimes the driver said they couldn't find the addresses of the electoral offices where the lists were supposed to be delivered. So, in fact, some of them didn't get delivered. So it's very mm. possible that people could have been uh, asked for the list and they mm. didn't arrive. So they never got them. So <laughs> you just never know what can happen. Right. You know. I, I want to I want to ask Colby and Nika about their experience because they're young and probably haven't voted as often as Betty and I. But um, <laughs> I, when you mentioned that the candidate list also says the party, the name, I remember one of the first times I voted. And so somebody, a volunteer working at the poll station, came in with me to read me the list uh, because back in the in those days, there was not a list in Braille but they didn't read the party name. And I was really young and naive and I didn't understand, you know, I sort of knew the names of the people that were on TV, but that wasn't the names of the people in my riding. And so, but I was too embarrassed to say, you know, can you please tell me what party as well? Because I knew which party I wanted to vote for, but I didn't know the name of the person in my riding. So I don't even know what I did in that situation. I don't know if I just picked the name I like the best. It's very embarrassing, but that was, I was really young, but I, yeah, we need, we need all the information. That's okay, Sean. I can tell you a funny story. One time my husband, Don was assisting me to vote before, as you said, before they had any lists or braille templates or anything like that. And he He's a real joker. He said, I'm going to vote communist for you. <laughs> and the election officials heard him and they almost wouldn't let him <laughs> do my ballot. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, at the, I think it was a muni So municipal elections, there is no Braille list of candidates, right? No. However, there is a machine. It's very cool, but it's only available in certain places because it's a very expensive machine. But they've used it in Vancouver anyway, the last couple elections. And um, it's an audio machine. And so you it's like a computer. You, you feed your ballot into it and then you have keys that you can use. And there's a key that says vote when you're ready to vote for a specific person or something. Oh, and there's nice. like, oh, I think the last civic election, there were 27 or 28 people you had to vote for. And you could actually do that and review it before you printed it. And I meant to ask Rob what the company name was that does these um, machines. And I forgot something right. an auto mark is what's in my head mm, but i don't mm -hmm. know if that's the right mm -hmm. name but anyway they're amazing and and they're they make it accessible for so many people like a low vision person a totally blind person i mean i'm all for braille because um you know my 
how much I appreciate and use Braille. But this one, in many ways, has even broader accessibility when it's used. And, and I really do wish that they'd have these machines more available, especially for civic elections, when you've got so many people mm -hmm. that you have to vote for. And it, it's truly completely independent and you wear headphones and so nobody mm -hmm. else is listening to what you're doing and it's very cool yeah that is cool. yeah that is really cool yeah that sounds so good I was uh so at the last municipal election they made my husband sign something swearing that he had marked the ballot as I asked which I just thought was quite amusing because I mean, he could easily sign it and not have done that. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's like putting a lot of giving a lot of power to the person with you. <laughs> OK, let's Nika and Colby, what has your experience been so far with voting? Sure. So I am actually I don't know if lucky would really be the word, but I've always wanted to vote and I viewed it as like my duty as a citizen to vote. And the year that I turned 18 was also the same year as the federal election. Um, and when I went to the voting station and voted, they had the Braille list like right ready to go. It was right beside the person who did it. So I didn't have to go through any kind of hoops with that, which I was surprised um, but then she said that I had to have my mom go with me in the back to vote because the instruction said to draw an X. And basically, she said that if I couldn't mark my ballot properly, and if there was one tiny little mistake, then they'd throw it out. And then like, I was like getting paranoid and my mom was getting paranoid. And she's like, okay, like I need to go with you. Um, and I also felt very rushed because I was trying to read all the candidate names just to see like who everyone is and you know what we have and just where everyone's name was and their position um eventually she marked my ballot for me and in this particular case we voted for the same party so there wasn't really any issues with that but then the next year our provincial election was um brought forward one more year uh so we did it in 2020 instead of 2021 and that time was actually a much worse voting experience. Uh, the Braille list wasn't ready. And the woman's basically straight up said like, oh, like it's going to take me a while to find it. It's just going to be easier if you tell your mom who you're going to vote for and she'll do it for you. And there was just a lot of people. So I didn't even have time to read the candidate names. Um, and I had to tell my mom who I voted for once again. And in this particular case, um, we disagreed. So federally, I did vote liberal. And because the federal liberal party and the provincial liberal party aren't the same, my morals kind of matched differently. So for BC, I voted green. And my mom doesn't really understand that the federal liberals and the provincial liberals are different. She thinks they are the same. So when I voted green, she was, I don't know if angry was the wrong word, but she was kind of disappointed in me. And she still kind of mentions it today, even like, why are you <laughs> volunteering with the liberal government? If you voted green, you're like kind of a traitor and you're betraying them. And it kind of turned into a whole thing. And I kind of wish I had, that independence because then it would save a lot of that conflict. I know, I know what you mean because I don't necessarily vote the same as my husband. And yeah, if he's coming in with me and he needs to help me and you know, like, it's just that the, there's a reason voting is supposed to be anonymous. So absolutely. That and that's why to me, it's so important for people to be able to use the template. And like, there's no reason why you can't use that template. If somebody puts the ballot in correctly, and you know, the number, and you know, you you can press not too hard, but hard enough and to make an X. I mean, of course, I don't know if how beautiful my exes look, probably pretty awful, but I'm sure they would be adequate and the ballot wouldn't be spoiled because I'd be pretty choked if I thought that every time I voted, my vote never counted. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, and I think uh, the other issue I had too was that 
person at the provincial voting also always spoke to me in the third person. So she'd address my mom mm. and not me. She oh, actually no. literally asked my mom, oh, who is she voting for? <laughs> at least, oh, uh, at least in the federal election, um, I was spoken to directly. So I guess that's why it was also a better experience. What's your experience been, Colby? I went to vote and I went with my dad. And um, at the time, I wasn't really aware of um, what was available, like Braille or large print or whatnot. Um, so I went and the first time I went and somebody like at the voting said that they could um, take me to vote. Um, and at the time, I was still pretty young. So like my dad just did it with me. Um, but then since then, um, the last time I went, it was kind of funny. So I went and they were like, do you want the Braille? And I was like, yes. So I got the sheet and I had the valet. And um, I went to, so I was, I'm reading the Braille and it's like the instructions I want to do. And I was like, okay. And then I had the um valid card that has like the circles that you can feel and the numbers but they didn't give me the list of names oh no oh i was like uh (laughs) dad um yeah i need you to read the names because uh it doesn't tell me so i don't know if they didn't realize or they forgot to give it to me or what they might but have lost was, a page or something. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah, I was like, well, that was really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's, oh, I mean, that's the challenge with their, like, it's volunteers mostly, right? And they're yeah. there for the one day. And I know there is training because actually I worked with Rob Sleeth way back we went to Victoria and we were part of the training video of how to you know, assist a person that is blind in the voting process. And so like they receive training, but they receive so much training for this one day and blindness is just a blip. And so to expect that they're all going to remember all the protocol and everything, it's a lot, right? In defense mm-hmm. of the volunteers, but, yeah. I, know. <laughs> but I just, I walked out and I thought, well, wow, wow that was really helpful. <laughs> So you didn't have numbers on that piece of paper, eh? Like numbers one to five or anything like that? Oh, they weren't I there? Oh, had that. Well, that's the that, list. But, but there was no names on it. Oh, each number is Our, like it'll say number one, John Smith. Number no, two, but the, Billy had, Jones or whatever. But the, but the plastic um, template, well, the template has doesn't numbers say that. too. No, yeah, it just, so the yeah. other one is just a legend, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the Braille yeah, so list just is just, that. yeah, it's just a, a list so that you know what, no, like, you know what number you want to choose. So maybe, Betty, can you explain what you should expect in your polling station? What are they going to give you exactly? Because right. I feel like there's there's a few things we're collecting here. Right. So so as far as I know, at the federal election, there will be um, a template that somebody can insert the ballot into it correctly and then it will have numbers on it that correspond to the numbers on the list of of the braille list that you you will get if you want to have one or you can get someone to read the list to you and they'll say number one justin trudeau number two jugmeet singh number three Aaron O'Toole or whatever. And then you would find, let's say you wanted number two, then you would look for number two on the template and then you would take your pencil and it's a circle, but an X is is a a cross basically, sort of a a slanted cross. So you kind of go from the right corner, right top right corner to the bottom left corner and the bottom uh, right corner to the top left corner i think i said that right think so, anyway yeah. Yeah. make an x <laughs> i printed yeah. x right so, so, yeah. so yeah. yeah so so the braille list is only meant to be a guideline so that you know which person to vote for and it yeah. actually corresponds with the printed ballot so that you're marking the right person 
Right. Um, yeah, that's, just, that's how it I'm, works. I just never got the Braille with names. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. I didn't know that so, there even was a, a Braille instruction sheet, but that would, <laughs> I mean, I could see how people would be confused or be like, okay, here's the Braille. Yeah. Okay. Here you go. One page of Braille, a print ballot, stick it in the plastic template. You're good to go. <laughs> Not realizing that maybe there's more than one page of Braille. That's yeah, so you, usually it's only one page and usually the instructions are at the top and they're very, um, you know, there's there's only one or two sentences and then the yeah. list is below as a rule or it'll have, um, it usually has, well, in BC anyway, it has the name of the electoral district. So, okay. um, you know, it'll be East Kootenai, Kootenai East or Kootenai West or, you know, something like that. And then it it might say something like, choose the number that corresponds uh choose the number on the list that that corresponds with the number on the template so you can vote or something like that it's very uh, very straightforward but i think that they often don't even give any instructions yeah so it's um it, it can be a bit challenging especially especially if you don't really know what to expect yeah. And I think, I know definitely for me, when I started voting, I had no idea and, and it's, it's definitely evolved over time, but you know, every experience from somebody I know coming in with me to a stranger coming in with me and doing it for me. And then you're sort of like, like what stops them from putting what I want and not putting what they want. And, you know, just all these things that make you question, did this work effectively? Is my vote being counted? Uh, so, I mean, I, I remember the first time I was able to use the Braille list of candidates and mark my own ballot and feeling very excited and empowered by that. Yes, I agree. I, I just think it's really important for us to be able to to do that if we at all possibly can. I mean, they do provide other alternatives, like someone, if you bring someone into and you want that person to mark your ballot, now they have to take an oath that they're going to mark it the way you mm. request. Um, so, and, and you know, you can even get someone, I think, now to vouch for your ID if you don't have any, uh, or at mm. least if, if you don't have the right um, ID with you. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If this someone says you are who you say you are, um, you know, can be a family member or friend or a worker or um, something like that. So there's quite a bit that happens before you even get to the polling station. I was just curious, you know, how you all (laughs) decide who you're going to vote for. How do you find the material or the information about the, the people that are running or the parties? Do you just listen to the news or, you know, where do you go to decide, to help you decide? This is actually my favorite part of voting is just doing all the research and all the digging. And I think I do it on a combination of looking on the website, but also looking at past experiences. And for me, federally, my decision was quite easy to make just because, um, of what happened in the past in Canada. And I also read kind of what was on the party's websites. And I do research on not only like the four main parties, but also kind of all the obscure ones as well, which is a lot harder to do, I find. But I look at kind of percentage and probability too, like who's more popular in the polls, who has kind of a more chance of winning. Um, And then for British Columbia, I kind of looked at it, we have three main parties, and I didn't really like what either one was doing. Um, And I just kind of voted for what I thought would make the biggest difference and would take us in the right direction. So, I mean, with the internet, that has definitely opened up our world. Betty, before there was the internet, how did you find out information about the the candidates and the parties and how did you make decisions about who you're going to vote for well i would listen to the news quite a bit and sometimes a couple of times i i went to candidates forums just because i thought that would be an interesting thing to do and to 
to hear the person actually speak mm -hmm. about what they, um, you know, what they were, what they stood for and what their party platform was all about, stuff like that. Yeah, I actually went to one of those forums for the municipal election last time and, and I found that super helpful just hearing each person speak and, and figuring out who's who and what they stand for and what they're promising. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and before I forget, I should mention that um, the Braille lists are only going to be available on elections day. Uh, they won't be available at the advanced polls. Uh, okay. So if you wanted to vote in the advanced poll, you probably won't have a Braille list. Um, mm. the, look, there will be large print lists at the advanced polls, but no Braille. Oh, that's I, very helpful. I think the reason <laughs> is because the, the candidates, the last day for them to declare or whatever is the 13th, and then oh. whoever is embossing it only has like a week mm -hmm. <laughs> to get the Braille ready. So I suspect that's what the issue is there. Oh, okay. They also have signature guides, but I don't know why you'd need to sign anything. But in case you needed to sign anything, they do have signature guides at the um, right. polling stations. Okay. And then I learned, I feel like it took me many years to figure out all the things that are involved in voting, but that you need to register to vote if you've never voted before. Or I think also if you've moved, is that, how mm -hmm. does, does anyone know? <laughs> What's yes. the situation with registering? Yeah, I um, you will get a register a voter registration card in the mail, um, and it if you have moved, um, you might not get it. If you forwarded your mail, you might get it, but it'll have the wrong address on it. So um, there is a phone number that you can call uh, for Elections Canada, and I don't know if they let you change your address or not, but they might. Um, so, you know, that would probably be a, a good thing to do. And that voter registration card, I don't think has any Braille on it or any. Nope, like, it, we're just, it no. doesn't. No, yeah. you'd have to um, scan it or get someone to tell it because it also has where you're supposed to vote on it mm -hmm. as well. Right. right. Yeah. So is there another way to find out where you're supposed to go if you can't read what is sent to you? Yeah, I think you can call uh, Elections Canada. I'm just looking for the number 1-800-463-6868. Okay. And and you tell them where you live and they'll tell them where you need to yes. vote? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And it's often in some obscure place like a, well, not obscure, but an elementary school gym or a church basement or yes, something like that. that some place you probably don't. Schools, Jen. Yeah, some place you you don't frequent, <laughs> most likely. Yes, and apparently they actually have magnifiers as well as the large print. Oh, really? Um, hmm. So that's that's kind of nice for people who have a bit of vision. Right. You can just ask for one and that they have they have it at the polling station those are probably useful for all those people in their 50s who yeah. need cheaters and forgot them I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> they have a few of those large grip pencils as well that are easier to hold okay. but i don't i don't know you know how many they might have but and you were saying the other day, Betty, that we're supposed to bring our own pencil to vote because of COVID. Is that? Well, they're suggesting if you feel uncomfortable using a pencil that someone else will have used, then mm -hmm. you can bring your own. And it, it, it didn't used to be allowed, but now oh. it is. Okay. Good to know. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. I would mm -hmm. not own a pencil if I did not have a, a seven-year-old child. <laughs> Yes, fortunately, I have grandchildren, so I have pen access to a pencil. Too. Yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something a lot of us blind people don't necessarily need ever. Mm. The, the other interesting thing is that apparently they have some voting screens that let in more light. So I guess if you're a person yeah. who is low vision who requires more light then hmm. you know you can ask if they have a voting screen like in the voting booth that, that has more light right because you're kind of going into this little cubicle like area like they're they're blocking 
people from being able to see your paper yeah. from their paper, which I do remember when I had a little bit more vision that it is pretty dark in there. It's just, just cause it's, it's blocking all the light, right? It's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that that's good to know. Yeah. Just and they've mm-hmm. tried to make them all, th- th- sorry, Colby. Um, they've tried to make all of the, uh, as many as possible anyway, of the polling stations accessible. Like the election, if you go into a room through a door, it's the, the where you vote is also going to be on the same level. Okay. About the pencils. Um, is it a pencil though? Because I feel like if it was a pencil, it could be erased. I think it is usually a pencil. No, it's all, it's always a pencil. It's really? Something really? Because yeah. aren't aren't are they um are they checked by a computer or by a human? I think they're checked. Well, I don't want to say I'm not absolutely sure, but I'm pretty sure they're checked by both. To be honest, okay. I think a human looks at them and a human counts them actually. And then I thought they were put into a machine, but. Mm. I'm yeah, not that's certain. I've never too. done that, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Right. Because I'm just thinking of like, remember those tests where you had to like fill in a bubble yes. with a pencil? Yes. Like yes. there's obviously something about pencil markings and the computer that works better than a pen or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like in my <laughs> very not expert opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we show up to vote. Um, I, I, you have to go through quite a few people. I feel like, you know, you're, you're sort of, you got to line up based on your name or something. And then they're, they pass you on to the next thing. And of course you, you're going to, if you're blind, you're going to say that you need the braille list of candidates or you need whatever accommodations. And then you go to a different person and it's all quite chaotic. Um, has anybody ever gone by themselves? Because I have not. I've always gone with a sighted family member or usually a family member. But has any any of you tried the whole experience on your own? No. I have not. I confess. Yeah. No. I haven't. <laughs> I mean, it it is, you're usually, it's also, you know, a location you've probably never been to and that, like it. I, I would recommend taking a sighted guide if you have that option. Um, yeah. I have heard of people getting a ride to a polling station. Uh, is that something that's available to people who are blind? I haven't seen anything about that um, at all. Uh, you can request um, information from Elections Canada in Braille before the election if you want to read about you know, mm. how all the different ways to vote and mm. um, all of that stuff. And I just noticed today in the CELA newsletter, I don't know how, how many of you get it, they've produced an audio election guide that's on their website. Oh, interesting. And oh. The, link, the link to that guide is um, in the CELA newsletter. Hmm. And actually, I got something in the mail. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure if they just know that there's a blind voter that lives in my household, but I got a CD sent to me from Elections Canada. Wow. Um, really? which I guess I guess CDs are still used today. They're not gone to the wayside. Boy, do you ever rate? I didn't get one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get one either. Yeah, no, no, it was so cool. And um, I don't know, that's why, like, honestly, I can't imagine how, like, you did everything, like, before the internet, just because, like, even with the CD, I'm like, how do I play this? I need to find my CD player that we have or put it in my laptop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So- Yeah, I'm not sure what it contains. I don't know if it's about like the different parties or anything, but it's just so weird to think about how now anything I want to know, like what is this party's stance on this issue? I can just research it and it's at my fingertips. Yeah, it's great. We love the internet. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So I think we'd all like to vote online. I mean, if if it was an accessible way to vote online, like a secure secure account. Yeah, that yeah. would be nice. Yeah. Well, was there not? I thought there was something about the CNIB put out. There was a way that you can vote over the phone. You could 
Um, you could for sure with the BC election. That was something brand new that they introduced. Oh, okay. I don't see it for the federal election here at all. Yeah. Okay. You can get a mail-in ballot, but that's not accessible to us. So you couldn't yeah. vote um, independently. Okay, so let, let's talk about you, you get to the polling station and you ask for the list of candidates in Braille and they say, oh, no, we don't. that doesn't exist. What's the best approach? I would say that you um, you you heard about it, uh, you, or you saw it on the Elections Canada website, or um, it was part of all of the voting information that you had access to. So please look for it. Right. <laughs> That's what yeah. I would say. <laughs> you could also try. I heard it on the Limitless podcast. <laughs> You could. <laughs> that might not get you very far, though. <laughs> I mean, good good promotional skills. <laughs> yeah. yeah now, so... Apparently, this a lot of this information is also available in other languages too. Mm. So, if people needed the information in a different language, they can go to the Elections Canada website, and um, there are I don't know what languages they offer. But I, I think it is um, the, the information is available in some other languages. Okay. So in terms of ID, that's always a tricky one um, because I know, I mean, we got our BC IDs before we moved. And so our care card and BC ID has the wrong address on it. Oh, and they say yes. that you have to have a piece of ID that has the current address. Okay, my passport has the wrong address on it. So I'm thinking, oh, gosh, what am I going to bring? Because they want you to have two pieces of ID. Mm. So you, I could have mm. used my CNIB card, but it also has the wrong right. address on it. So... <laughs> The voter registration card, if you're lucky enough to get one of those, yay, it has the right address on it. And then you actually can use something like a passport or a student card, even if it doesn't have the right address, as long as you have that voter mm -hmm. registration card, you're okay. Okay. But, you know, um, you, can, um, you can use a whole bunch of different other stuff like, let's see. You could use a, your voter information card and you could bring a bank statement or a utility bill or, um, oh, you can have someone vouch for you. But I don't know that to me, that's a bit crazy because there's so many different things that you can use. You can use a band membership card or you can use a birth certificate or you can use a Canadian citizen citizenship card, a mm. Canadian forces ID card, um, a Canadian passport card issued by um, an Inuit local authority. You could even use a firearms license as ID. Oh, wow. Can you believe it? Oh, wow. <laughs> And you could use like a government check or check stub. So okay. if you were getting money from the government, you know, you, you could, um, you would use that. It's funny about the BCID with the wrong address. I have been living in the same house for mm, seven years and <laughs> I still have the wrong address on my BCID because really? it's, well, when you don't have a driver's license, you're not worried about it like how often do I even need to show ID I'm not I'm not getting ID'd anywhere really um I don't look underaged anymore unfortunately <laughs> so <laughs> I've been almost denied getting on an airplane because my ID didn't have the correct address and it's happened to me multiple times and I've been like oh I really need to change that and then I just happened so it expires too, Sean. So it's oh, probably okay. expired. Oh, you're, you're don't they expire every now. five years? <laughs> I, I don't know. So. <laughs> I do have a passport that that is like not expired. So that's I just use that. But I guess I should take care of that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm pretty sure when I went, I used my visa ID as my primary, and then my university student card as my secondary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah you can you can totally do that. So they they have made it pretty easy for people that there's so many different things, you know, that people can use. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Well, I 
I'm excited. I'm, I'm happy. Like the one time that I did go vote and they, they just said they didn't have any braille. I, I started doubting myself. Like I, I thought, no, they, they must <laughs> like, they're supposed to, I know they're supposed to, but I didn't fight it because I, I doubted myself. So now hearing this, like definitely uh, provincial and federal elections in British Columbia, you know, that will be available is like really reassuring. And, and I would definitely advocate for it next time. Good. And, yeah. yeah. And I encourage everyone else who needs it to do the same, because I think the more we ask for it, the more they'll realize that it is essential and, and continue to do it too. Right. Yeah. I definitely won't sit passively the next time. Like I did last time. Mm-hmm. Great. Because they actually, you know, pay, a fair bit of money to get all those lists produced. So if nobody asks for them, then they won't pay to produce yeah. them and then we won't get them. Right. Yes. yes. So it's important if we can to, to use them. Mm-hmm. But I don't know where you voted Nika, but one of the problems that I had with the courier was uh, somewhere, somewhere on Lonsdale, they couldn't find the office. And so they never got delivered. I was really upset. Oh uh, yeah. Mine you probably afraid- wouldn't be there. Yeah. yeah, I was right in my neighborhood. Uh, oh, the yeah. voting station for both the provincial and federal election were in my high school gym. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So they should have had the list because I didn't have any trouble with the. Well, I shouldn't say that because when when you courier these lists, you courier them to the main electoral office for the district, and then they distribute them out to all the polling stations. So if they didn't get their package of lists, which happened... I think in three different districts this time because of good old Purolator, um, not delivering them, uh, then um, you might not have had one anyway. <laughs> well, I did have one, but the person working there specifically just said like, oh, it's too time, time consuming. It would just be easier if your mom does it. Yeah, don't ever accept something like that. You you have the right to vote as independently as possible. So I'm glad you're you're going to, stick up for yourself next time. I guess my feeling about voting is that for me anyway, and it's not the same for everyone, but for me, it's really important to be able to vote as independently as possible. And so if you have someone else do it, probably they're going to do it the way you want it done, but it's, it's not you doing it. So mm-hmm. you can be more independent if you do it yourself, even though it, it takes a little bit of extra work and means that you have to go on a certain day or whatever. But I guess it's everybody's personal choice too, because some people just prefer to have someone else mark their ballot, whether it's a friend or family member or election worker, whatever. And you know that's up to the person, I guess. Mm-hmm. And if you do it yourself, you can be comforted knowing that your husband didn't vote for the Communist Party for you. <laughs> <laughs> True. To this day, I don't know who he voted for. <laughs> but then I don't know if my ex ever came out properly either. So maybe all these years I've been yeah. doing, you know, spoiled and, balance. And, a, and in a British Columbia uh, provincial election, if I go and if they ever say that braille ballots are not a thing, I will say, well, I personally know the one who made them all. So <laughs> <laughs> not right. a braille ballot, though. Be careful. You got to use the right language because the ballot is just a print ballot, but the braille list of candidates. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Be super careful because the, there is no such thing as a braille ballot. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'd and make you... everybody vote in braille. Wouldn't that be something? That'd be perfect. <laughs> I love uh... it. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Now, after you mark your ballot, there's a way to fold it, isn't there? Or does it matter? There is a way to fold it. Um, I always have trouble with figuring out what the correct way to fold it is, but I always put it in the ballot box myself too. So Mm -hmm. um, just, just because I can, you know, I I know somebody else can do it, but I want to do it myself. So yeah. Just I because agree. I can, but I do admit, I think I probably have asked if I, I've folded it correctly. Well, okay. No excuses. 
all those listeners who are <laughs> blind or partially sighted across Canada, please go out and vote, make your vote count and uh, know that it's accessible pretty much. <laughs> yeah pretty much being the operative word but yes <laughs> it's better yes. than it used to be <laughs> it sure is well thank you betty for joining us and sharing all your wisdom and you know giving us an update on what we can expect at this election and uh thanks nika and colby for sharing your experiences as well yeah it thanks was great to be you. here and i actually learned some stuff i didn't know before me yeah too. me too well, I had a good time too. I always like coming on the Limitless podcast. It's a lot of fun. So thank you for having me here with you. I'm sure we'll find some reasons to have you back again, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. If you have a question, a comment, a future topic request, please send us an email to limitless at blindbeginnings.ca. Please share our podcast, like, subscribe, and join us next time. This podcast has been brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Music for this podcast is composed by Sean Bishop and Clement Chow. Production and audio editing by Rob Minot. For more information about Blind Beginnings and the work it does to support children and youth who are blind and partially sighted, along with their families, visit us on the web at www.blindbeginnings.ca and also remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.